Amen. You may be seated. If you will turn in your Bibles to the fourth chapter, the Gospel of Luke, as we continue our study through the Word. Now, you will remember last time how John the Baptist burst uh, onto the scene. And here, this mighty prophet was out in the wilderness at the Jordan River, and he was calling the nation to repentance. For the kingdom of God is at hand. Get your hearts right and prepare, for the Messiah is on the way. And here he was baptizing people. Now, now the nation of Israel, they had been continuing to offer sacrifices. They still had their temple. They still had their hours of prayer. There was a lot of religious activity that was going on. But their hearts, huh, their hearts were far from God. They were just going through the motions uh, of their relationship with God. And John the Baptist goes to shake up the nation and to tell them to stop doing things by rote and get your heart right with God. Draw near to God and God will draw near to you. And that was his message. And, and draw a line in the sand and get baptized. And, and now go forth and continue to, to press it into God. And that was the, the message of the nation. And the people were like, are you the Messiah? And he was like, I am not. I am, whoa, I am not the Messiah. <laughs> he says, I, I'm baptizing in water. <laughs> But there is one coming after me who will baptize in fire and in the Holy Spirit. He says, of whose sandal I am not even worthy to loose. And John is calling the nation to repentance and getting them, getting them ready. And then one day John turns and who does he see? But the Lord gives him a, a revelation knowledge that it's the Messiah that is standing right in front of him. And he's standing there in order to be baptized. He's come into the, the water to be baptized. And, and John is undone. He's like, Lord, I need to be baptized by you. And are you standing in front of me to be baptized? And you remember that, that Jesus says to him, suffer it, permit it to be so for now, that all things may be fulfilled in righteousness. You see, Jesus was setting the example for us that all of us need to get our hearts right with God, to be baptized and to pursue after the kingdom that Christ is setting up. And so he set that example and he goes into the waters and, and he's baptized. And it tells us that as he is baptized, that, uh, that the skies open up and, and there's a voice from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And it says that the Holy Spirit in the shape of a, of a dove, in the form of a dove, descended and, and rested upon him. The the Holy Spirit in the shape of a dove. That, that's the symbol of Calvary Chapel. That's that funny looking thing on the wall over there. Nobody knows what it is. That, that's the Holy Spirit. If you ever wondered what is that? It's not modern art. Okay, that, that over there is the symbol of the descent of the Holy Spirit coming down from heaven. And, and Jesus is standing there in the waters and it is this unbelievable, glorious moment. It is the beginning of his public ministry now. For 30 years, he has just been growing up in obscurity. But now the time has come for him to usher in the kingdom of God, to, to open up the, the, the kingdom. And, and now we are going to see that, that the beginning of his ministry, the Spirit leads him directly out into the wilderness, into this period of fasting for 40 days of just communing with God and fellowshipping with him. Fasting. Fasting is, a, is one of the disciplines, one of the spiritual disciplines that I think is, is probably, possibly, just my opinion, one of the most underutilized of all of the spiritual disciplines that God has given to us. 
Fasting is, is powerful. It is powerful. Fasting is just the locking down of the flesh. It is denying it of its appetites so that you can what? So that you can set the spirit free in your life to pursue the spiritual things. Now, the flesh and the spirit war every single day between one another. But when you handcuff the flesh, that now gives the spirit more room to just operate more freely in your life. And so it doesn't matter what you fast. You can fast anything at all that's an appetite of the flesh. It is just putting the flesh in its position and saying, I'm not going to be ruled over. You're not the boss of me. You're not the boss of me. And letting your flesh know that, because sometimes that's a battle. Sometimes we know where the flesh starts to take control over us, and we, we don't really want to have that fifth piece of pie, <laughs> you know. Uh, but it is there, and someone needs to eat it, uh, so I don't want it to go to waste. Uh, uh, and, and so there are those challenges, those times when that flesh starts to, starts to get more control of our life. Fasting is a great way to just lock it down, set your spirit free, and to just get control over your life. And so here we see that Jesus now is going to be led into the wilderness, but he is going to be tempted right after he comes down now from, from this mountaintop experience of his baptism, the affirmation of the Father, the Holy Spirit descending, he's going to go into the wilderness and he is going to face temptation. And so one of the things that we're really going to be talking about today is temptation and overcoming temptation. Jesus is going to kind of give us the pathway that we can follow. He himself was tempted in all ways and yet didn't sin. And so we also are tempted in our lives. One thing that every single one of us has in common is, is that we are tempted on a regular, ongoing, daily basis. Amen? And so in order for us to have a victorious Christian life, it's going to be important for us that we learn how to overcome temptation. It is going to be a part of your life for the rest of your life. And so God wants us to be victorious. He wants us to be overcomers. Christ is going to set the path. And so we're going to learn from Christ the way that he overcame temptation. And with those insights and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, God's desire is that we would all be victorious over temptation in our lives. So let's jump in here. Luke's in chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. And then it says, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit <laughs> into the wilderness. So we see Jesus coming out of the Jordan River. That's where he was baptized. And immediately it says that he was filled with the Spirit. So we have the Holy Spirit upon him. We have this infilling of the Holy Spirit. And then we have this being led by the Spirit. Being led by the Spirit. Having God lead us in our lives. How important that is that we allow God to direct our lives, to lead us into the blessings and into the fullness of the life that he has for you. God has a plan for your life. He has a plan for your life. And this is what I will absolutely promise you based upon the authority of the word of God. His plan for your life is so far superior to any plan that you could have for your own life. But you have to let him lead you into that life. It doesn't say that Jesus came out of the baptismal font and started his public ministry and then built a business plan and began to execute that business plan. He didn't decide. Notice that it doesn't say, and he decided it was a nice day. He would head into the wilderness there. What happened? He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, he was allowing God to direct him, and we need to have that same sense of allowing God to lead us into the paths that he would have us to walk on. He built you for a purpose. He put you together with the gifts and the personality and, and all, and your body and your looks and everything. He put you together for purpose. But you can never wander into that purpose. God has to lead you into the purpose that he created you for. And so here we see Jesus being led uh, into the wilderness. Now, I want you to know it was really interesting what happened to us when we were in Israel this year. They have allowed now pilgrims for the first time ever 
to be able to go to the Jordan River where John the Baptist was baptizing and where Jesus was supposed to have been baptized, someplace in that area. Now, the problem up until now has been that the River Jordan, the Jordan River is the, uh, the border between Jordan and the nation of Israel, except up at the Sea of Galilee where the Jordan River flows out first, and that still is accessible. That's where we've always gone. That's where we've always baptized everybody, but it's right up in Galilee, and that's the only place that you've had access. Well, where Jesus was is right outside of Jericho, and that's on the border between Jordan and Israel. But right now what happened is that, well, the Jordan River being the dividing line between the nations, they put military fences on both sides of the Jordan River, and then you had a banned area. You couldn't even get near the Jordan River. You could see it, but it was far away from where you were allowed access. But what they did on both sides, on the Jordanian side and also on Israel's side, is they now have let people come into this one spot where you now have access. And so we're able to go to the, the very place. And right in the middle of the Jordan River, that's where there, there's these little floaters. You know, don't cross over. You're in another country if you go on the other side. And just in case you forget, there's soldiers with machine guns over there on the other side to remind you. However, they do smile and wave, and, and they are very nice. Now, the Jordanians can also come to this same place uh, uh, as well for the first time. But this is the first time just a couple years ago they opened this up and this is the first time now that you've ever been able to go to the Jordan River in this area. And so Jesus is baptized here and you have the descent of the Holy Spirit, but there's something else that's really interesting and special about this spot. It also is the very same place where Joshua crosses over with the nation of Israel, right to the east of Jericho. They cross over Jordan and there is Jericho right in front of you. And so this is the same place as Jesus now begins his public ministry and he enters forwards to open up and to build the kingdom of God. This is the same place where Joshua leads the nation into the land of God's promise uh, as well. And then on top of that, it's all also the very same place where Elijah was caught up into heaven in the chariot of fire as well. So you have Elijah going up, you have the Holy Spirit coming down, you have Jesus crossing over to enter in, you have Joshua bringing the nation in all at this same point. So Jesus now is baptized, he's affirmed by the Father, he crosses over and it says that he's led into the wilderness. Well first what happens is that you cross cross right through Jericho. Jericho's maybe a mile, mile and a half. I mean, you can see it clearly from the Jordan River. There's Jericho. And then on the other side of Jericho, another mile, mile and a half, easy visibility you can see is the beginning of the Judean mountains now that ascend and begin the ascent to up to Jerusalem. But there's all of these caves and there's all of this burnt limestone rock and it is just wilderness that is out there. And this is where Jesus goes. He goes from the Jordan River, passes right through Jericho now and, and there you are right into the Judean wilderness. And so it says he's led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And it says, verse 2, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. Now that's interesting because normally, kind of in our mind's eye, when we think about the passage of Jesus being tempted by Satan, oftentimes we just kind of have this picture that Jesus fasted, you know, for these 40 days and at the very end, Satan showed up and there's these three temptations by Satan at the end of his fasting. But that's not the case. Look at what it says, that he was tempted for 40 days by the devil. So he was harassed and tempted and interrupted as Jesus is trying to spend this quality time with the Father, as he's just trying to connect in prayer and worship. He's constantly being interrupted and tempted by Satan. Now we have at the very end the final three temptations that come before him, but he had this prolonged period of being aggravated and being tempted by the enemy while he is fasting there in the wilderness. It says in verse 2, 
and in those days he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. So he fasts for a long period of time. 40 days is a long fast, but it's not unprecedented in the scriptures. We see that Elijah also fasted for 40 days. We also see that Moses, when he went up and received the law, he also fasted for 40 days. And so Jesus here fasting for 40 days. Now, he is depleted, he is hungry, uh, and now the enemy is going to come and make one last uh, bid, a string of three temptations now to try and trip Jesus uh, up. And so uh, it tells us now in verse 3, And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. Now, I want you to know in the original language uh, there, if you are the Son of God, really a better translation of that is since you are the Son of God. In other words, Satan knew exactly who Jesus was. There wasn't any question like he's uncertain as to who Jesus is. He is saying to him, since you are the Son of God, why don't you take the power that you have and turn this stone into bread? There is no doubt in my mind that that stone was in the shape of a nice loaf of bread uh, that was right there. And when you're really hungry, you know how anything starts to look good, you know, after a while? Jesus, you've got the power. And to take that rock and to turn it into the most delicious loaf of bread that you have ever eaten in your entire life. And, and, and what is the temptation that he is truly giving to Jesus? He is suggesting to Jesus that he take the spiritual power that he has and make it subservient to, to the flesh, the spirit in the flesh, which is in first and which is in second which is going to serve which he is saying since you are the son of god why don't you use the power that you have to meet the needs of your flesh serve the flesh with the power of the spirit and so we see our two natures uh, as believers we have the flesh and we have the spirit and we know that these two are warring one against the other the flesh is always seeking to gain supremacy in your life to have you to be a person, a carnal person who is now driven by the lusts of their flesh. But we see that Christ has told us that we're to crucify our flesh now and to pick up our cross and follow after him, to love, live the abundant life that is lived only through the denial of self, that we're to live for others and not to be controlled by our base carnal appetites in our lives. And so here we see have the spiritual be subordinate to the flesh. This is the message. And we see that Jesus just instantly responds. And he talks about the fact that life is not just about your carnal existence, about your physical existence. You have a physical existence, but you have a spiritual existence. Your physical existence, it's temporal. It is going to end at some point in time. But your spiritual existence, that's eternal. That is going to dwell forever. Never, ever, ever take what is eternal and make it subordinate to what is temporal. This is what Jesus is going to talk about here. And he quotes scripture, verse 4. But Jesus answered him saying, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And so he quotes out of Deuteronomy in chapter 8. And, and in this, we see that Joshua is leading the nation now into the promised land, crossing over the Jordan River. And, and this is what he says. Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to test you, to know what was in your heart and whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger and to feed you with manna, which you did not know nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. You see, the spiritual man is fed by spiritual manna, and that is God's word. The physical man is fed by physical food, by bread. But do not think that you exist only in the physical. You 
have to feed both your physical body and the spiritual man as well. I think about how much attention in our culture we put to the physical man, to our shape and to exercise and to diets and to cooking and to eating and to wearing and clothes and fashion and all of the things to, to take care of the physical man. And then I say, how much effort do we put in taking care of the spiritual man? In your life, how much time are you spending taking care of your physical, which we know is passing away, and how much time are you spending taking care of the spiritual, which we know is eternal? And so here we see that what Jesus is saying is, is that there must be a recognition that there's something more important in your life than your physical existence. And make sure that your physical existence never takes supremacy over the spiritual man, but always keep that in priority. Always remember that you and your soul is eternal. And the physical, that's just a tent that is wearing out. <laughs> that's a whole nother subject. <laughs> The wearing out of our tents. Uh, uh, but anyways, the spiritual man, that uh, is eternal. And so he quotes him the scriptures, and, and we see that Satan is unfazed by it. The, the temptation fails. And so he just simply puts another piece of bait on the hook and casts it out again. He is the angler for the destruction of your soul. That's who he is. He is a fisherman that seeks to destroy your relationship with God and every single relationship that is important with you. And he is trying to latch onto you and to draw you away from everything that is important in your life. And so when one piece of bait doesn't work, he, he's unfazed by that. He just brings in the hook, puts another piece of bait on it, and casts it back out to see if maybe you'll nibble on this. Maybe you will bite on this. And so he does this with Jesus, and he now casts his line a second time. Then the devil, verse 5, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me and I give it to whomever I wish. And therefore, if you will worship me, all will be yours. The temptation that is before Jesus is this. Look, the will of the Father is that you would come and set up the kingdom of God and you're going to redeem the earth and you are going to take back possession what Adam lost. This scroll, this deed to earth, I have it. And you know what? I will just give it to you. You don't need to go through the cross and the crucifixion, gruesome stuff and the scourging and all of the betrayal and everything, nasty things. Hey, here, I, we, just hit the easy button. <laughs> you came for the scroll. I'll give it to you right now. All you have to do is just worship me for a few minutes. It's no big deal, and I'll give it to you. You can have God's will, the redemption of the planet, all the glory of the earth. You can have that. You can have God's will, just do it my way. And there is the compromise. Not God's will, God's way. But now, God's will, but we'll just uh, go a little bit of a different route in here. And that is so oftentimes a temptation in our own lives. We want to follow after God, but it's hard to follow after the kingdom of God. And, and so the voice of compromise, 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 compromise in your walk, compromise in your attendance at worship service, compromise in the reading of the word of God, compromise, compromise, compromise. And so here we see the, uh, the battle now to not, be trusting in God's provision for your life and not in trusting that God will lead you into the fullness. But, but here we see now uh, the compromise. And, and in verse 8, we see Jesus' answer. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. And so once again, we see Jesus quotes out of Deuteronomy and uses the word of God. It's interesting a phrase that he uses there, Get behind me, Satan. 
There's someplace else that Jesus is going to say that very same thing. Only he's not going to be saying it at the beginning of his ministry like he is here. It's at the end of his ministry. And he's not going to be speaking directly to Satan. He's actually going to be speaking to a person. In fact, it's a, a disciple. In fact, it's the apostle Peter that he says this very same phrasing to at the end. Now, it's interesting because Satan can put a thought right into your head. It's important for us to recognize and to understand that. And when he puts a thought into your head, it sounds just like your own thought. It, it isn't this outside voice. It's an internal voice. That's the way he can put a thought into your head. And, and what's interesting is that God can also put a thought into your head. So we've got three sources of thoughts. So know this, as you are just living your life, you've got your own thoughts, and then you have Satan that can shoot a thought in, and you have God that can shoot a thought in. And, and in fact, at the end of Jesus's ministry, you'll remember the context of that. They were uh, up north, uh, and Jesus says to them, who do you say that I am? And that's when Peter says, you're the Messiah. You're the son of the, uh, of the living God. And what does Jesus say? He says, Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed that to you, but my Father who is in heaven. You see, God revealed that, put that thought right into his head. And Jesus says, you didn't figure that out. Guess what? That was revelation. That was a thought straight from God. And so Peter, ding, ding, you know, he's a hero boy. He, he's used. And then you remember that right after Jesus says that, uh, you know, he affirms that he is the, the Messiah, he then goes on to say, and now I have to go to Jerusalem. Jerusalem and I'm going to be crucified and I'm going to be rejected by the religious leaders and Peter's like whoa 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 what's all this you know somber talk you don't need to do that you know come on let's cheer up Jesus you know and uh, and so he tells him what does he tell him he tells him you don't have to go to the cross what did Satan tell him three years earlier you don't need to go to the cross I'll give you the scroll. And when he hears, you don't have to go to the cross, he knows exactly who the author of that statement is. That is coming straight from Satan. And so he immediately rebukes uh, uh, the thought and he rebukes uh, Satan. Get behind me, Satan, uh, there because Satan had put that thought into his head. I want you to know that it's important. It's important that we understand that there are three sources of thoughts. It's important that, uh, that godly friends and godly people, that the enemy can put an ungodly bit of counsel right into their head and they can speak it out to you thinking that, that it's godly counsel. And so it's important that we test every single thing against the scriptures, that you test what the friends are saying, what pastors are saying, what teachers are saying, every single person. Because you never know that the enemy is not shooting a fiery dart into their mind and then they're repeating it back to you. And so getting to learn the voice of the Lord, knowing the voice of the enemy and the way that the enemy is going to tap, is in, it's vital in preparing us to be able to overcome temptations. Well-meaning brothers and sisters in the Lord and spiritual leaders can give bad and spiritual counsel and that oftentimes can be coming right in from a thought that is being placed into them. So we see here that that the avoidance of the cross, you don't need to sacrifice your life. God's will, but an easier way. This was the impetus behind that second temptation. And then finally, the third one. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, verse 9, set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the Son of God or since you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you and... In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Now, the first two times he tempted Jesus, Jesus turned around and quoted Scripture <laughs> back uh, at uh, Satan. So what does Satan include in his third temptation? Scripture. He now quotes uh, Scripture. Don't ever think for a minute that Satan doesn't know the Word of God. Satan knows the word of God, I believe, backwards and forwards. And I would postulate that it is possible that he even knows the word of God better than any of us or all of us put together. 
He knows the word of God. But what is he is a master at is taking scripture out of context. That is what he is the master at. And so he lifts two passages here out of the Psalms that talk about the protection of the Father uh, over us and over the Messiah. And he says, do you know what would be a great way since you're just starting your ministry right now? Remember, he's just come out of his baptism. He's just been 40 days. He's just beginning now his ministry. He says, you know, a great way to start your ministry would be this would be if you throw yourself down off of the top of the temple it's 450 feet down to the bottom of the Kidron Valley from the top of the temple and as you start coming down the angels catch you and float you down in front of all of the people and you land uh, in the middle of the temple is that a spectacular entrance for the messiah or what uh, and so he, he he now becomes his pr man you know and helping him with a you know with, with his kickoff to his ministry here uh, and so we see the uh, the temptation now that is before him but uh, here you see that, uh, that once again, what, what is he talking about? He is talking about presumption, presuming upon God, putting God to the test. If the word of God is really trustworthy, then prove it right now. Show me how much faith you have in the word of God and jump off uh, of the pinnacle top and prove that the word of God uh, is true. And so it's an attack uh, on the word of God. We see that not a lot has changed from the first Adam who was tempted by Satan. It's interesting that with the first Adam, he came first with food, with fruit. And the temptation came now. It was pleasurable to the eye, taste, and eat. The first temptation with Jesus was bread. Take this stone and turn it into bread and, and take a bite. We see that the temptation against uh, the first Adam was, has God really said that you shall not eat from any of the trees and the fruit? And it was an attack upon the word of God. Here we see that, that this now is an attack upon the word of God. We see with the first Adam, the attack was on the will of God. Has God really said this? That, that's not the will. Here, I have an easier way. I have a better way for you. And so it was challenging the submission to the authority of God and that God has a good plan for your life and to allow God's life to be lived out in you. And so here the attack on the word of God. Prove to me that you you really believe in the word of God and throw yourself down and demonstrate and so here we see that Jesus now once again he quotes scripture he goes back to Deuteronomy all three times he quotes he quotes out of Deuteronomy and it says in verse 12 and Jesus answered and said to him it has been said you shall not tempt the Lord your God you are not to put God to the test that is the sin of presumption and so we see that Jesus parries away all three attacks all three of the temptations and it says in verse 13 now, when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. You see, a fisherman, when he's fishing and the fish aren't biting, what does he do? He goes away. He goes home. He eats. <laughs> he goes and gets a sandwich. You know, you go do something else. Uh, you know, it's not profitable. The fish aren't biting. But uh, you are going to return at a, another time. A fisherman isn't done. He's going to come fish at a different time or with different bait at a more opportune time. And, and so know this, that Satan departs, but he is still an angler for the destruction of men's souls and and he will return at an opportune time james 4 7 says uh resist the devil and he will he'll flee he'll depart he'll go away it's not profitable he he's tempting you you're not having any part of it and so he says okay good i'll come back later with a different with a little bit of different bait or at a little bit of different time you see, it's important to recognize that he is studying you and he's studying me. And your bait might not be the same bait that is my bait or somebody else's bait. And so he, he learns, where is your weakness? 
Where is the temptation? Where is the foothold, the toehold that he can get uh, into your life? Where, where and what fleshly appetites do you have that you are specifically susceptible to? And he studies that and he knows that and about you. And then what time of day? You know, fish bite at different time of the day. It's important to know what time they're going to be biting when they're high or low in the water and what bait, what length of line to use to make sure that the bait is right in front of them at the right time when they are willing to bite that line. And so for some people, man, the dangerous time is first thing in the morning. They wake up in the morning and, and you know what? The enemy is there to just submerge you with condemnation nation over every mistake you've ever made in your entire life and it makes you not even want to get out of bed and you know what there is the enemy just attacking or for some people it is it's right after work and just trying to get home and not be drawn by their flesh to turn their car and, and head someplace else other than to, to come home is a temptation. The enemy now puts that in front. For others, it's the evening time. For others, it's the night time. For others, it's late at night when everybody else goes to bed. And that's when the enemy puts the bait right at the right line, right in front of you, seeking now for you to bite. But you see, the, behind that bait is that hook. The fish never sees the hook, it sees the bait. It sees the promise of this wonderful meal, of this satisfaction of a need that they have, and the, and the enemy places that in front of you. And, and there is always the allure and the promise of fulfillment of the flesh and fun and excitement or, or gratification. And, and yet, when that bay is taken, there is a hook that now will get lodged. That fish had free will to go up and look at the bait, to swim around the bait, and to go up and down and to nibble that bait. Had free will up until the minute that it clamped down onto the bait. And the minute that it did that, it lost its free will. And that hook is going to be set, and that fish is going to be taken to places that it never wanted to go. It is true of the fish, and it is true of you and I. Satan always has a hook, and that hook will grab you and take you to places that you never wanted to ever go in your entire life, and that God never, ever wanted you to go. And you will experience pain and hardship in your life that God never intended you to experience, that he never wanted you to experience, uh, and he is seeking to draw us into victorious Christian living, and to be aware of the wiles of the enemy so that you can avoid the temptations and that you can live a victorious and Christian life. I want you to know that that is possible and that that is God's will for your life. But we are living in a time that there is more temptation possibly than at any other time in the history of mankind. Certainly we know that nothing is new under the sun and, and immorality is nothing new and, and vile moral environments, that's nothing new. You look at the Grecian Empire, you look at the Roman Empire and the immorality, the rampant divorce, the, uh, the, the sexualization of the culture uh, and all that. It, it was horrific back then. But today we are living in a time where we have had a technology explosion. An information an explosion has taken place unlike anything that the world has ever seen. And there are very many parts of it that I'm very happy about and I'm very excited about. You can fix just about anything with YouTube videos and do it yourself out there in your house, leaky sinks, I mean everything. Go on there, look it up, you can fix anything. And the other thing that's just completely gone away is the endless bickering and quarreling among friends uh, over three years ago who was the MVP of the National League and, and and you know back when I was growing up it would be like well I think it was so and so and there was no that was two years ago three years ago it was this no you're wrong on that and we would go back and forth forever and you could never prove anybody wrong because no one could actually look it up you couldn't find the answer anywhere to a question like that but today all of that fun of the bickering and the bantering and the quarreling that's all gone Google who was the MVP uh, three years ago and it ends in two 
two seconds. Uh, and so this access to instant information, it just settles all the fun of arguing now, you know. But on top of all of the amazing things that, that it can do and that it does do, there is also a whole other side to this information explosion that has taken place. And that is the absolute rampant spread of evil that is available on it. That there now is a delivery system to take every single vile, evil thing that you could possibly uh, want to, to look at or investigate, and, and it is instantly delivered to you in an anonymous way in which access there has never been in the history of the world. One of the great dangers is when you have opportunity intersecting uh, with uh, temptation. One of my prayers in my own personal life is, God, help me to stay out of the intersection of temptation and opportunity. You know, there's sometimes I'm weak in the flesh, but I don't have access to sin. <laughs> and then there's sometimes I have access to sin, but I'm not interested. And then there's times when, when there is opportunity and there is temptation that intersect. And those are the time that test men's souls. And I say, God, I keep me from those. I don't even want to go through those uh, intersections whatsoever. But it is harder and harder today with the ubiquitous nature of the evil that we have in front of us. Uh, and so, since we have been called to live in just such a time as this, we need to be good uh, at overcoming temptation. Amen? In order as Christians to, 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 to take and, and to live these amazing lives that God created us for, we have got to be able to avoid temptation and to be able to overcome the wiles of the enemy. And here is the reality. The reality is God chose you and me to live in just such a time as this. And he has called us now to stand upright in this time and to be able to overcome every temptation that befalls us. God promises that you will never be tempted beyond what you are able. No temptation overcomes you, but such as is common to man, and with it he will make a way of escape, lest any man say that he is tempted beyond measure. God has a filter over your life, and he will not set you up for failure. But at the same time, we need to be wise and not put ourselves into a position to fail. And we need to be able to overcome the temptations that are set before us. And so, filled with the power of God, knowing the wiles of the enemy, and being able to navigate, being led by the Spirit, I want you to know that God's desire is intimacy and fellowship and communion with Him that is not broken by a constant failing and falling to the temptations that are around you. But you have been made and created to be an overcomer. And you have been created and made to be victorious in your Christian life. And God's desire is, is that you would be able to stand. Put on the armor of God. And when you've done all to stand, then stand. And stand and live victorious in your faith. Amen? Amen. Okay, so let's move on now. And we see that uh, he departs, but he waits uh, for an opportune time. And so it's important to recognize that temptation is going to be with us today. It's going to be with us tomorrow. And it's going to be with us until we breathe our last breath. We need to be able to overcome. Verse 14, then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. The news of him went through all the surrounding region. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And so he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. So Jesus is baptized and goes into the wilderness down by Jericho. And now he comes back up to Galilee. And he comes now to Nazareth, to his home village where he was raised. And he goes into the synagogue that he's gone in his entire adult life that he has been raised into. And when he comes in, they give him the privilege of reading the scriptures that day. And so he stands now and he takes the scriptures and it says in verse 17 and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah and when he had opened the book he found the place where it was written the spirit of the Lord is upon me 
because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. Jesus opens up the scroll of Isaiah and he reads, listen to this, a messianic passage. That is a passage about the Messiah. And now here he is, the Messiah, reading the passage on the Messiah in his hometown, in Nazareth, in his local synagogue, and he sits down now to teach him. That's the posture of the teacher. And now all the eyes of the hood are on him. Everybody that, uh, that grew up with him, everybody is looking at him, and their eyes are on him. And then Jesus opens up his mouth, verse 21, and he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus now answers two critical questions about this passage here in Isaiah. The first question that he answers is, who did Isaiah write of? And Jesus says, me. This passage is about the Messiah. And I am that passage. I am the Messiah. And in his hometown, in the local synagogue, he tells them that he is the Messiah. The second question that he answers here is, when is this going to come to pass? <laughs> and he says to them, today. Today, this passage has come to pass, and I am the Messiah. And he declares it in Nazareth, uh, where they know. And, and look at what the response of the people is. And it says, and so all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? And so it says that they marveled at the gracious words which proceeded. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And here is perfect truth, proclaiming truth. And that truth is being received. The Messiah is here. The fulfillment of the scripture is now taking place right in front of them. And that truth is entering into their souls and they're receiving it. And then all of a sudden they go, <laughs> Wait a minute, we know who you are. Aren't you? You're Joseph's uh, son. And suddenly what happens now uh, is, is that that truth that they had been receiving, uh, it now comes into conflict with their sight and what they carnally can understand. And so their sight is now stumbling them in receiving of the truth. And, and look what happens next. We'll have to stop here. Next time we will, next week we will pick it up from here and we will see what happens uh, uh, with Nazareth and the village now uh, as Jesus declares that he is the Messiah in their midst. For right now, I want to turn to verse 18 for a second here before we close. And in verse 18, we see as a description of every single person that's accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. If you've accepted Christ, this is exactly a description of it. He says that the, 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 the Messiah has come to set up the kingdom of God and that he is going to preach the gospel to the poor. Now, I want you to know the gospel just means the good news. He's going to preach the good news to the poor. He's not talking about those who are monetarily poor. He's talking about those who are poor in spirit. See, the person who's poor in spirit, that's the opposite of a person who's self-righteous. A person who is self-righteous says, do you know what? There's a lot of good things about me. There's a few things. There's some sins, but no more than most people. Basically, I'm a good person. If you ask that person if they're going to heaven, they say yes. And you ask them, how do you know? And they say, because I'm a good person and good people go to heaven. They're self-righteous. They've evaluated their righteousness and they have declared themselves, I am stamped righteous uh, by myself. I'm self-righteous. Uh, now, the opposite of that is a person who's poor in spirit. A person who's poor in spirit, it means that they look at their sin and they say, I am a sinner. I have fallen short of God's standard for my life, and I have broken God's uh, moral law, and I am in trouble. I am in trouble because I recognize and understand that the standard for heaven is no sin whatsoever on my soul. 
and I now have sin on my soul. And I am poor and desperate and needy. And I am in trouble. And I am in trouble. That's a person who is poor in spirit. And what did he say? He says that he's come to bring good news <laughs> to that person who is poor in spirit that recognizes that they're a sinner and they're stuck in their sin. The next line he says, and he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. When you are brokenhearted over your sin and you are stuck in that place of separation from God, he says, I have come. The Messiah has come to set up his kingdom and to, to take care <laughs> of sinners and to heal the person that is brokenhearted over their sin. He says to proclaim liberty to the captive where sin once bound you and held you captive. He now is going to break the power of sin in your life and you are going to be set free. Who the Son sets free is? is free indeed and so he has come to set every captive to sin free and the recovery of sight to the blind you see sin blinds you to the truth of who god is and the truth of who you are in christ and that god loves you and that god desires an eternal relationship with you you see sin takes your eyes off of the light but jesus is the light of the world and he restores back to you your ability to see clearly and he says to set at liberty those who are oppressed. You see, all of that is a description of what happens when, when you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And today, if you are poor in spirit, if today you recognize that, that you are a sinner and that your sin has separated you from God, then there is great news. The Lord is here today to open up his arms to you and to invite you to come and to receive that gift of salvation. And as we close our service right now with a worship song, if that's you, if the Spirit of God has moved upon your heart today and you who once were self-righteous now can move to a place of being poor of spirit, of recognizing that there's none righteous, no, not one, and all fall short of the glory of God, and every single one of us is a sinner. And none of us will make it into heaven with sin. And that we simply need a Savior to wash away uh, our sins. He's the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. And God wills that none should perish but that all should come to everlasting life and spend eternity with him. Christ came to live out this life and to die for you so that he could pay the penalty for your sin. He could wash you of your sin and you can have eternal life and spend eternity with God. That's his invitation. And today he's inviting you into that kingdom. And he also tells us there's no other way into the kingdom of God. There is no other way into eternal life. Self-righteousness will never get you and no amount of good works will undo the things you've already done. You're already disqualified from the kingdom uh, of heaven. And even if you live perfectly from this point forwards for the rest of your life, it wouldn't undo the sins you've already committed against God. But he came to preach good news to the poor in spirit. That if you're poor in spirit today, he will wash away all those sins. And so as we worship, I want to invite you to receive Christ to have him wash your soul and for you to now be a description of this, be your description of your salvation in your life with your Savior. He's waiting here now and I'm gonna invite you to just come to the front and at the end after we worship, whoever's here, I'm gonna lead you in a simple prayer of inviting Christ to come and wash away your sins. So if you wanna receive Christ, you stand up and you come now to the front as we worship, stand up and come to receive Jesus.